Cheers, everybody. Happy Sunday. I am not going to be going into the whole entire introduction and all the music because Cody's not here. He doesn't. We don't need a warm up if Cody's not here. I just jump in, get it done. So welcome to Sunday service. Here we are, August 14th. It is absolutely my pleasure to hang out with you guys tonight. We're going to be talking about the creative finance strategies that you need to know. Very interesting part of creative finance is that I would say one of the most challenging part of cre parts of creative finance is that most people don't understand how simple it really is. I know that sounds counterproductive to everything you've ever heard, but creative finance actually is very simple. And so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to go through some very basic things so that you can get through and understand some of the basic strategies that work in creative finance. But more importantly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out by applying it to your everyday life. Now, let's talk about the main strategies, okay? The main strategies in creative finance are always going to be these, okay? You've got sub two, okay? Sub two is the process of purchasing a house, uh, an apartment building, okay? A mobile home park, if that's what you wanna buy. By the way, these are horrible drawings. Um, it, you can buy dirt, you can buy land, you can buy massive commercial buildings, you can buy anything, anything, anything with subject two. Subject two is just the process of taking over somebody else's debt and becoming responsible for those payments. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So you've got sub two, you've got seller finance. So you going to the seller and then the seller financing you. It's really interesting. I, I mentioned this to somebody in my Instagram DMs and they go, okay, so if the seller is financing you, well, where are they getting the loan? And I said, man, that just tells me how little you actually understand about seller finance. We're gonna talk about that today. So you've got sub two, you've got seller finance. You've got novation agreements. Okay, novation agreements. You've got lease options. Okay, these are acquisition strategies, by the way, acquisition strategies. So how do I buy something? How do I get control of something? Acquisition means gain control, acquire, right? How do I acquire? This is not how I sell it. This is not how I make money. This is just how I gain control of something through acquisition. So you've got sub two, you've got seller finance, you have the novation agreements, lease options. You've got arbitrage. That's something that you and I don't talk too much about. And I'll tell you why tonight. Um, you've got, um, let's see, sub two, seller finance, novation agreements, lease options, arbitrage. And let's just double check. Let's just make sure I'm not missing anything on this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump in. Hey, guys, 400 plus people watching me live. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm going to go through my exit strategy um, sheet and just make sure that I'm not missing anything. Really, really simple. Sometimes you do that. Okay, sometimes you do miss stuff. But what I want to talk about tonight are the acquisition strategies that you guys need to know. Okay, and then I'm going to apply them to everyday life. All right, ooh, ex yeah, executory contract, hybrid, novation agreement, ooh, short sell. Oh, yeah, we got a lot. We got a lot that I skipped over. So um, executory contract, just that word alone, no wonder people are having a hard time getting into creative finance when they first start. Executory contract is like, wait, what? That sounds scary. Oh my gosh, what is that, right? So you've got executory contract, you've got um, innovation agreements, you've got short sale. You can gain control of something through a short sale. Um, ooh, Morby method, gosh dang, that's so good. Morby method is a great acquisition strategy. Then you've got um, hybrid seller finance is kind of the same thing. And then you've got, you can buy things on cash and do something creative with it. Okay. So these are the strategies in terms of acquiring a property, right? And what's interesting is that so many people that are just brand new to real estate, all they really understand is they understand how to buy things with cash or get a loan, right? That's what we're all, um, conditioned, educated, prepped up, primed 
our environment has told us that that's what you do. You go get a down payment, you go get a loan, right? Um, the only strategy in there that requires you to go get a loan is the Morby method. Everything else you don't need a loan for. You don't need a bank in any of those scenarios, which is very, very special. And so a lot of people, they have a hard time really relating it to everyday life. And they have a hard time really getting into the mindset that is required to understand how simple creative finance really is. So let me tell you guys a couple of stories. I'll relate this into regular life, okay? So my mom and my dad, um, as I grew up, I had 12 siblings in my family, 12. That is right. I had 12 siblings. I was number three out of 12 kids. We had nine kids underneath me. I've changed more diapers than most moms that have two or three kids. Personally, I have changed more diapers than most mothers that have two or three kids. I was the third oldest, nine children underneath me. I changed thousands of diapers. My parents um, taught me responsibility at a young age. And we worked really, really hard. And the person that taught me how to work hard, believe it or not, was not my dad. My dad taught me, you know, through example, my mom really was the hardest working person in our family. So um, with my mom, my mom just being so amazing and, you know, them having 12 kids, a dozen, they had a dozen children. My dad didn't always have money, right? My dad um, was primarily working two jobs all our, our lives. He was working a corporate job. Um, he worked, he was the CFO for Rockford Fosgate. Anybody that's speaker company fans, my dad um, got an accounting degree, became an MBA, he got, got his MBA and started doing accounting for some really big firms, one of them being Rockford Fosgate. But, you know, there was a crash in 83 and there's all sorts of things. And so my dad just learned to always fall back on a second source of income, which was painting and contracting. As we grew up, my dad was like, wow, this is great. I actually make just as much money in my twilight hours as I do in my day hours. So my dad always had two sources of income. However, there were ebbs and flows of that income. And my mom learned from a young age, being a good Mormon gal, she learned how to sew, be a seamstress, make prom dresses, do all those types of things. And why, why do I always got scam artists in here? Guys, if, I, if you ever hear me talking about Bitcoin and you spend money on that, that's your fault. Do not, do not ever send me money ever. Okay. Crazy. It's crazy that they can actually get my name. Like that's the crazy thing. If these people actually spent time doing something productive, oh my gosh, imagine what they, they could do. It's crazy. So my mom being the woman that she was, she said, you know what? I'm going to bring sewing into our family life. Meaning I'm not just going to fix my children's clothes. I'm not just going to sew my daughter's prom dresses. I'm going to create products and I'm going to go serve, you know, serve our family by producing income. So my mom said, all right, I'm going to make teddy bears. I'm going to make dresses, prom dresses. I'm going to make suits. I'm going to make clothes. I'm going to do whatever people need me to do. And I'm going to turn a profit so I can bring cash home to our family. And my mom just kind of always had a nest egg, right? She was making this little nest egg on the side for rainy days. Great mom. Amazing mom. Well, she really wanted to scale this business. And so she ran into an issue. And her issue was she didn't have money. And my dad was so busy putting money into other things that my dad wasn't putting her, you know, in a position to win as far as being a seamstress went. So my mom went to my dad and was like, look, I need money. I need a couple thousand dollars to go out and buy the materials I need so I can turn around and flip this, right? Fixing and flipping, basically buy, buying raw materials, improving it and selling it to a retail client. It's called fixing and flipping, right? Everything in real estate is no different than, than everything in life. So my mom went to my dad, said, hey, I need a couple thousand dollars. And my dad said, get creative, Corolla. My mom's name is Corolla, C-A-R-O-L-A. Get creative, Corolla. Figure it out. I don't have the money. I remember hearing this when I was younger. So my mom, this is what she did. She went down to, um, it's not Michael's, but let's just imagine it's Michael's. Michael's didn't exist back then. But my mom went down to Michael's supply store, right? They have tchotchkes. They have um, essentially materials. They have th um, um, all the things that you need to go out and do seamstress work. 
So she goes there. She applies for a credit card. She gets denied. She has no experience. She has no credit. She has no credentials. She has no income. She has nothing. So they basically deny her. Like even like the store wouldn't work with her. So my mom came home, talked to my dad. My dad says, get creative, Corolla. Figure it out. So my mom, laying in bed, comes up with the idea to go to somebody in her church and say, can I use your credit card? And what I'll do is I'll use your credit card, your credit, your debt, your credibility, right? And I will then go and purchase things at Michael's. $1,000 of materials, $2,000 of materials. I'll renovate it or fix and flip it and I'll sell it to a retail client and I'll make $2,000, $3,000 and I'll pay off your credit card debt. And then I will give you a little piece of the action. Well, the churchgoer, the person who gave her the credit card said, I don't want anything. I just want to help you. That's amazing. Yeah. Use my debt. Use my debt to go buy something that you need. So my mom never had to use any of her own money. She never had to use her own credit. She actually used somebody else's credit. And she went off and built a business off the back of somebody else's credit who was like, yo, I'm perfectly fine with using mine. And so my mom was essentially buying her materials subject to. She was buying materials subject to somebody else's credit card statement. And that's what subject to is. It's the process of, of buying anything, utilizing the debt of somebody else, the name of somebody else, the credentials of somebody else, obviously with their permission. And so when somebody says, well, why would they do that? Well, because they want to help in that situation, right? So my mom built a business by utilizing subject to somebody else's credit card, somebody else's credentials, somebody else's stuff. It's common. This, these types of things happen all the time. Even when you go out and you get a, get a car loan, right? When somebody's co-signing and putting their name on your items, using their credit, their credentials, their um, you know, job history, those types of things, you essentially are buying to something subject to their credit, their credentials, et cetera. So subject to is something that I've watched my whole life. I see it happen all the time in business. We utilize it all the time. So it's a great way to buy houses, right? So subject to a great way to acquire houses. So my mom in a situation where she had no cash, no credentials, no experience, no um, anything, she was turned down to go get credit cards was able to use somebody else's credit and the credentials to go out and utilize that credit card to build a business. And I remember my mom always having cash, always having cash. My mom didn't let that stop her. Whether she had cash, she had credentials, et cetera, she didn't let that stop her. So that's one way of doing that, okay? Now, here's another one that's really interesting. So that's subject two. Let's talk about seller finance for a moment, okay? Seller finance in regular life I have one of the greatest seller finance stories, but I've got a second one for you tonight. One of my favorite seller finance stories is the first seller finance deal I ever did. And some people are expecting to hear a story about my a house that I bought. No, my first seller finance deal was not a house. My first seller finance deal that I can recall was actually when I sold my F-150. Okay, so when people say, well, what is seller finance? Well, I have something paid off, right? I own something. There's no debt on it. I own it free and clear. And I decide I want to sell it. Well, when I decided I wanted to sell this truck, it was being used in my construction business. And inside my construction business, this truck would make us really good money because I would send crews out. It was a four-door Ford pickup. Um, had four doors on it. So you could send four guys, sometimes five or six, because I had the bench seat in the front and a bench seat in the back. So you could send out six guys to a job site, truck would be full of all their tools, supplies, et cetera. And essentially what happens is this truck starts having little issues. And I was starting to spend money and I was noticing like, hey, you know what? This is gonna, this needs to go to somebody else that's willing to deal with the issues. You know what, that, you know what I was? In real estate, they call me a tired landlord. I have an asset that I'm starting to get tired of. Something that I'm like, I wanna sell this and I want top dollar, it's starting to become a headache for me and it's not worth a headache. That's a tired landlord, right? Real estate shows up in our everyday life all the time. So as I'm telling you these stories, I've got five or six other really good stories. As I'm telling you these stories, think about how this shows up in your everyday life because it's everywhere. Creative finance is everywhere. It's incredibly common. So when people say, I, you know, I don't get it, 
you're dealing with it all the time. Even I'll get to the story about groceries in a little bit and you guys will go, wow, I'm blown away. You guys are using creative finance to buy groceries commonly all the time, all the time. You guys use subject two all the time. So here's what happens. I decide this truck really needs to get sold. So I go to Kelly Blue Book. I know a lot of you guys, 90% of you have heard this story. So I look at Kelly Blue Book and I go, all right, so it's a 2001 Ford F-150. It's got 320,000 miles. And I go to Kelly Blue Book and I realize that this truck is only worth $5,000 in its as-is condition. And I also realized that if I put this truck on the Craigslist for $5,000, I already know that this truck is not going to sell for $5,000. There's no way it's going to sell for $5,000. That's not what happens on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. Nobody pays the price that you list it for, right? They want to negotiate you. So you put it up for $5,000, somebody's going to say, I'll give you $4,700 cash. I'll give you $3,500 cash. I'll give you $3,100 cash. This also shows up in real estate all the time, Right? Homeowner wants $5,000. Real estate wholesaler comes in and offers $2,500. This happens all the time. The difference is I wasn't in pain, right? So I wasn't going to take some low ball offer. So I was actually the opposite. I was one of these sellers that said, I'm not going to sell it for what it's worth. I'm going to sell it for over what it's worth. And so I listed it. Literally, I went on Craigslist and I listed that truck for $10,000. Belligerent, like crazy lunatic thinking I'm going to get this sold for $10,000. Well, this F-150 doesn't sell after three months. I literally don't get a phone call, a text message, nothing, not a knock on my door, nothing. In fact, I probably had thousands of people scroll through and go, F-150, 320,000 miles. Wow, this guy's freaking out of his mind. Nobody said anything. Nobody messaged me, et cetera. Three months into this listing on Craigslist, my wife comes in, talks to me and says, hey, sweetheart, I love you. Don't, get, don't take this the wrong way, but you really need to sell that truck. I have to keep navigating around it every time I want to get into the driveway. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? I'm not going to list this truck for under $10,000 because it doesn't make sense to sell it for less than $10,000 because it makes our company money. She's like, it's causing you problems. There's issues. Just sell the thing. I'm like, what do you want me to do? And my wife had the idea. She said, why don't you put it on Craigslist and take payments for it. And I was like, wow, take payments for it. I like that. So essentially seller finance, I can, I can sell anything I want, create an agreement. That agreement in real estate is called the promissory note. I promise to pay you. Therefore we're writing it on a note, promissory note. Okay. I'll do that. So I literally go back to Craigslist. I change one thing, literally one thing. I said, F-150 will take payments. And I, I didn't sell that truck for 10,000. I sold that truck for $12,500. Literally sold the truck for two and a half times what it was worth because I was willing to take payments and a down payment without checking somebody's credit without going through and sniffing everything up about their life, calling their job, looking at their bank balance. I didn't look at any of that stuff. I literally took a thousand dollar down payment. I had to turn the ad off. There were so many people reaching out to me. So I ended up selling that truck for $12,500. I think it was at 4% interest and he made me $350 payments every month. So I ended up after interest and all of that stuff, I ended up making about 15, $16,000, something like that. I made really good money on that truck. And that's seller finance. I literally just took in payments on a monthly basis for several years. And that's seller finance. This happens all the time. I didn't realize how often it happens until I started entering into business at a deeper level because seller finance pops up in businesses frequently. Okay, if you look up um, Alex Hermosi, you look up Brandon Dawson at 10X, you look at... Um, probably one of the most prolific ones, Roland Frazier, Ty Lopez. Um, let's see, some really big names that I could go through. That, that's what they do. They go and acquire businesses on seller finance. And so I had a buddy, still do, one of my best friends, high school buddy. His dad owned an insurance business. My buddy's name is Leif. His dad's name is Larry. 
And my whole life growing up, I knew that Leif's dad was an insurance sales guy. What I didn't know is that Larry was building up a big book of clients, right? Something that could be sold at some point. Really, want, people want this book of clients, all these people that are continually on auto pay, on insurance, health insurance, car insurance, you know, life insurance, all that kind of stuff. So we get older, I get married, I go in town every 4th of July and I visit um, Leif and I visit, you know, the families up there and I say, hey, Leif, how's your dad going? How's your dad doing? He's, he's like, oh, he's happy. He just sold his business. Like what? He sold his business? He's like, yeah, he sold his business. He sold it on seller finance. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I didn't know you could do that. Right? This is like, I'm 24, 25. And he's like, yeah, my siblings who were working underneath him basically wanted to take the company to a whole nother level. They wanted to implement, you know, they wanted to put in social media. They wanted to start doing certain things that my dad was like, I don't, I'm not about that. If you guys want to take the business to another level, then buy the business from me. The problem is the siblings, Leif's siblings, didn't have the money to buy the business. So what did they do? Well, Larry sold the business to them for a very specific payment every single month for the rest of his life. He said, payment goes until I'm dead. Once I pass away, that's when that payment stops. I want that payment coming in every month to pay me for the rest of my life. I won't mess with, your, with, with what you're doing. I don't care how big you grow this. I just want my payment staying the exact same. And so they took over the business, literally no money out of their pocket, no, no down payment. They just had to take a portion of the profits and pay Larry his whole life. So 24, that was 15 years ago, Larry just passed away four months ago. So for 15 years, they made a monthly payment to Larry so he could live his lifestyle and do his thing. And he exited the business, but he sold that business on seller finance. This happens all the time. In fact, if you guys Google purchase a business on seller finance, you'll see dozens of websites, okay? Buybizsell.com. It's a website that sells businesses on seller finance. In fact, there's full-on brokerages that just help you go and buy somebody's business on seller finance. Creative finance is everywhere. Seller finance is everywhere. Real estate, it, it dominates in real estate. Yeah, but it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. Okay, great. So we've covered subject two. Well, I've got another couple of stories about subject two, but... Got two stories about seller finance. Here's another one that's really interesting. I, I put on my Instagram stories today about my son and his, in fact, here, I'll pull it up right now. 708 people here hanging out with me. Thank you guys so much. Hopefully you guys are getting some value tonight. Got a couple of really good stories coming for you. And I apologize that I'm not really looking at the side chat today. So hopefully you guys are networking with each other. I'm really trying to just make sure you guys get good stories and hear what um, a lot of this has to, um, a lot of this is. Let's see here. Come on, get me in here. Perfect. Facebook and Instagram have logged me out, logged me back in, logged me out, all sorts of things. Of course, now we've got a security code from Facebook. So hold on just a second. Man, what an amazing week I just had, by the way, um, spending all that time down in um, Miami with Grant Cardone and his whole team. What an amazing couple of days. Let me get in here. I want to show you guys something. For those of you that don't follow me on Instagram, you would just think everybody does, but they don't. What? Oh, there we are. All right, for the pause, guys, I just want to make sure you guys see this so you guys have some context of the next story. It's an interesting story. Okay, so when you guys talk about sub two and seller finance and some people are like, I just don't get it. I'm like, what do, you, how, what do you mean you don't get it? It's so common. It happens all the time. It shows up in your daily life frequently. So let's do a little screen share window. Boom, here we go. All right, 685 people on here because I took a pause. It's interesting if I pause for a second. But here we go, I'm hanging out today. Obviously, um, I communicate a lot through my stories. If you guys don't follow my stories, I just kind of document my day. So today I talked about my son. Um, you know, he's 14 days through the month and his profit is already 
um, or his rental business is um, at $1,590 on one of his trailers for the month. So my um, son, start, we started a, a trailer rental business. It was my idea. I went out, bought a trailer, et cetera. And um, so people started asking me. They started saying, hey, what business is this? So my son actually and I ironically were out cleaning the trailer today. So I took a photo and I said, hey, people asking me what my son's business is. He rents this trailer per day, 75 um, to $125 every single day. Okay. After all expenses, all expenses, he makes around $2,000 per month net. Pretty cool for a 14 year old kid, right? Um, next thing, we have two trailers he rents out. One I purchased before realizing I could just arbitrage one of someone else's. Cost was my cost. So I bought this trailer. It's a dump trailer. You guys can see it here. Bought this for $12,500. And then I started driving around neighborhoods. And I started um, realizing that there's all these trailers everywhere. Like tomorrow, I challenge you guys, write this down, take this note. And when you guys are driving to or from work, you'll start noticing how many trailers are littered all over people's yards. People have dump trailers, they have flatbed trailers, they have all sorts of things that are literally just sitting there locked up. They're not using them. In fact, weeds are growing up around them. There's so much income sitting there in order to make money. It's crazy. So I buy this trailer and we start renting it out. We start making money. I'm giving the money to him. And as long as I, um, the agreement with him is that 80% of the money that comes from the trailer, um, he has to invest 80% of it for his sisters and himself in my real estate projects or his own real estate projects. So he's already investing, right? A couple thousand dollars a month, which is great. And um, what's cool about that is as we started renting, I started noticing that there's freaking these trailers all over town. Like, why are these all over the place? And one day I decided, hey, let's go door knock. And we went around and we door knocked about 12 people. We ran into somebody who had a dump trailer similar to ours. And we knocked on their door. 12 people said no. One person said, yeah. The pitch was this. Hey, we, we, we rent trailers for a living. We see your trailer here. It's not doing anything. Just thought we'd ask you a crazy question. Would you let us rent that out to the public? Make sure it's insured. It's tracked. We have a little tracker thing. Make sure it's insured and tracked. And we split the profits with you after expenses, cleaning fees, et cetera. And the guy was like, yeah, I haven't used that thing in a year. Are you kidding me? Like, what kind of money are we talking? And I said, well, um, it could be between $500 and $1,200 a month, depending on how good of a job we do. He's like, are you kidding me? I'm like, bro, you could go out and rent this thing for $250 a month. Pay me $250. Great. I'll rent it to you for $250. We were like, no, no, no. We want, we'll pay you 50% of the, of the rental. And we, we walk away and I was like, man, I, I feel so dumb that I'm the creative finance guy. And I didn't think to just go out and arbitrage somebody else's trailer in the first place. I thought, well, let's go out and buy a $12,500 trailer brand new and rent it out. There was nothing creative about that. Oh, my daughter just came in here. Did mom tell you to come give this to me? Okay, why don't you why don't you come lay down in here? Okay, come here. Hold on, come here, babe. You can you can have my phone. Okay. You do. You want to watch Ninja Turtles? Okay, perfect. Mom doesn't know you're down here, does she? Because you're naked and you're not supposed to be down here, right? But but your dad your dad's not going to get mad at you, right? Hey, why don't you go lay down, babe? Love you. Okay, so I thought it was crazy that I started seeing these trailers everywhere. No, there's no education about this. I've, I've looked it up on YouTube. Um, nobody's really out there teaching you how to go out and arbitrage, take somebody else's trailer and rent it out. That's arbitrage. And that's creative finance. That's taking something that's not yours and making money off of it. That's called arbitrage. Now, the way it works mathematically 
is that both of these trailers rent for about, um, they bring in about $2,800 a month. But you've got about $800 in expenses, okay? We put about $200, $300 a month to the side for wear and tear, okay? Because you're going to have new tires, you're going to have brakes, you're going to have all sorts of things on these trailers. And then you've got some cleaning fees, right? Somebody needs to clean these things and spend the time and like put coins in the machine and brush them down and all that kind of stuff because your renters are going out and doing construction projects. That's what these trailers are. They're like these dump trailers. Those are the ones that rent the best, the ones that have the mechanical dumping, okay? Um, here, I'll, for anybody that actually cares about this, some people care about this, other people don't. But I will show you um, what they look like. Dump trailer. I think our trailer is a seven foot by four. Yeah, ours is a seven foot, foot by 14, okay? This is what the trailers look like right here. Okay, so like mine, mine's like this, 12,000. Um, I paid $12,000 for mine. This is what they do. Th these are what people rent for $75 to $125 a day. Okay, so they have a little button in here. It dumps all the stuff out, saves them tons of money on labor. People freaking love these trailers. They're amazing. Okay, so for this trailer... You can rent this for $75 to $125 a day, depending on the time of the year. So here I am, creative finance king, the guy who knows more about creative finance than anybody else, and I just didn't realize that I should have just been arbitraging other people's trailers. Now, there's some goods and some bads of this. The arbitrage side is that we are a little bit worried that it's not our trailer, right? We don't own it. And so here we are making money on it, and um, if something damages or whatever else, we've got to pay for that. And there's no real benefit to, uh, you know, we're not repairing our own trailer. We're repairing somebody else's trailer. So for me, like at the end of the day, I would much rather just get a trailer on seller finance. And so the next thing that we'll do is probably sometime next quarter, when my son gets a little bit more stabilized, we're going to get him a virtual assistant to kind of ha handle the communication and all that kind of stuff between the renters and himself. Once we get a virtual assistant to handle the text messages and the communication and all that kind of stuff, we will then go out and get a third trailer. But I'm going to ask the person who owns the trailer, can I buy that from you on payments? I've driven by here a couple of times over the last week. I see it sitting here every single day. Can I buy that trailer from you on payments? And that's what we will do. I'll, instead of me renting it from them and then turning around and renting it again, which is called arbitrage, I'm going to turn around and buy it on seller finance, and then rent it out myself so it pays my payment for me. And then I become the owner of that trailer long term. Now, arbitrage is commonly used in Airbnb arbitrage. You go to landlords and you say, hey, I see your property is for rent. I would like to rent that from you and turn that into an Airbnb. And either A, I'll pay you a higher rent rate, or B, we can even share in the profits of the Airbnb. It's a wonderful method to create creative fun, or to create cash flow. The problem is long term you don't own the asset. And that's what I don't love about arbitrage. I don't do it a lot because I don't like not owning something. But creative finance is everywhere, guys. These types of things happen all the time. Even the story about my mom, that technically you could argue either A that is um subject to or you could argue that that's arbitrage. I'm using somebody else's credit card to buy something for myself and paying them back once I use it. You could also call that a novation agreement, right? It's very similar to a novation agreement, depending on how you want to argue it. So the trailer business is interesting. Okay, let me pull this up. There's people that had questions from it today. So I'll, I'll see if I can answer those questions. Um, so... The trailer that we own, we make more money on. We make about $2,000 per month. And the trailer that we don't own makes about $1,000 a month because we're splitting the profits with the person that we're renting it from. That's the downfall of arbitrage. The, the one we own makes 100% cash on cash return, which means we bought it for $12,500. Every, um, let's see, 12, 24. Actually, no, it's 200%. It's 200% cash on cash return. So we double our money every year on this trailer. So we bought it for 12,500. Every year, this trailer brings in $24,000. So actually it's 200% cash on cash return. This one is actually a better cash on cash return because I didn't put a dollar into it. We don't make payments to this person until there's money that was brought in. So that's the beautiful part of um, trailer arbitrage is I can go start today, like tomorrow. 
Okay. So here's some questions that people had about it. Facebook Marketplace is where most of the renters come from. Sometimes it's Craigslist. It takes a few months to gain traction on this. Um, what do I mean by that? Is that you have repeat customers. They come back multiple times over and over and over and over again. And so if you um, keep posting, you'll start getting, in the very beginning, you'll get like two clients a week. But then your clients get to know you and they start texting you. They don't go through the ads anymore. And they go, hey, is it available next week? Hey, is it available next week? And you start getting to a point where half of your bookings are um, repeat customers and the other half are coming from the ads. And at some point, I'm sure it'll get to 70% are repeat customers. Okay. It's landscapers that have maybe just started in their business. It's construction people. It's demo crews. It's all sorts of stuff. These dump trailers are multi-purpose. In fact, somebody borrowed it yesterday that, or rented it yesterday that just was moving their house. Just a regular consumer. It was like, oh, wow. U-Haul charges $150 a day for these. This person's charging $75 a day if we run it for three days consecutively. If we run it only one day at a time, it's $125. So we save $25 going through this person as it, and it's cash. So we don't have like all these sales tax and all this stuff. So U-Haul is like $175. This kid's $125. We're saving $50. Bucks. So it's a better value proposition for the client. So of course, it takes a few months. You have to get repeat customers. It takes a few months. Trailers have trackers and insurance. Some, some engineers losing their, their mind overthinking it, obviously. How do you know? How, 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 how? All the time with engineers, dude. Meanwhile, I've already started running out trailers months ago, and you're still asking the question, how? So my son speaks to the renters through text. He does not get on the phone with them. I've trained him to um, automate it. We have videos, okay, that make it really easy. He's 14 and he's naturally an introvert. Doesn't mean he, yes, and introverts are a real thing, okay? Some people like extroverts like myself don't believe introverts are real, but they are real. He learned this strategy from me. I have a buddy at my country club that um, does this and I was like, wait, what? Huh? What? That's a thing? He's like, yep, it's a thing. He's got like four of them, brings in like six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month from four trailers. I'm like, hot damn, that's great. Took me about a year to take action on it because I was just so busy. And then finally, when my son got a little bit older, I was like, hey, it's time for you to have some income. So he learned the strategy for me. I taught my son to never need a dumb school. School won't teach your children how to make money. It won't. Nobody, no school is ever going to teach you how to make money. Your job as a parent is to teach your kids how to make money. Okay. Um, he makes more money than most adults he does. Um, and He'll be a millionaire at some point in the next couple of years. The trailer sits in an empty lot. It uh, has a hitch lock on it. So um, it, it, nobody can steal it. There's a lock box with a combo code. It's attached to the trailer. So nobody has to go pick these people up. The customers pick up and drop off without any involvement with us. Um, he made, we made a video. I made a video and I was like, Hey, this is the jump, jump, dump trailer. Here's how you use it. If you have this problem, it's because of this. If this happens, it's because of that. Here's the 10 top 10, you know, commonly asked questions. So he made that. And every time we, he rents it, he texts them that video. So, okay, that's it. So that's arbitrage, right? We found a trail, a guy that had a trailer, send him. I don't even know the guy's name. Asher deals with all that. So sends the guy a thousand dollars a month. My fourteen-year-old son is sending some homeowner that has a trailer that wasn't being used a thousand dollars a month. Do you think that guy's freaking happy? Now there's a point also where I will probably teach my son how to negotiate, okay, and how to go to that guy and go, hey, you know this has been going well. Um, the fifty-fifty split's been great, but I'm putting a lot of work in. I, I think I'm going to hire an employee, so my margins are going to get cut down. Would you be open if I just paid you a flat fee of five hundred dollars a month? And see what the guy says and teach my son how to negotiate, right? These are how you, this is how you teach your children how to do stuff. So that's arbitrage. It's pretty simple to understand. Now, for me, I prefer to just own the trailer at the end of the day. So in probably 90 days, what we'll do is we'll make a YouTube video of me knocking doors and we'll go buy a dump trailer just like this on seller finance. And I'll show you guys how to structure it. And you'll realize, wow, creative finance is everywhere. It's everywhere. You guys don't see it. That's the crazy thing. I was on a phone call today and um, Jared Penner, one of my students out of Florida, had a call with a broker and a seller on a 124-year deal in Houston, Texas. 
and I get on the phone with the seller. It's multifamily, big apartment building, 124 units. And I start talking about seller finance and the seller goes, oh yeah, I've bought every, everything I've bought, I've bought on seller finance. And most of the time I sell on seller finance to my tenants. But in this situation, I'm, re I'm really not going to do seller finance because I need to do X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 blah. It's when you're brand new in real estate and you're brand new in business that you think seller finance subject to novation agreements, arbitrage, all these types of things are new. They are new just to you, but people in business are using them commonly all the time. Buying businesses, selling businesses, merging businesses, borrowing this portion of this business to go do this event. And then when that event is, is done, you send it back. That's lease options. It's crazy. It's crazy. So think about this. This is interesting. Here's how lease, here's the kind of how lease option works. I don't think people have a hard time understanding how lease options work, but this pops up all the time. When you guys see me on stage speaking at events, there's about five or six teams running these big events, right? There's an audio team. There's a Zoom like backstage team. There's a, a stage team. There's an, a, a video team. There's all sorts of different individual teams, the food team, the welcoming committee, the, all the things when you guys go to like a big event, like a Clever Summit for a lot of people went to Clever Summit. They borrow, they rent those teams, right? Like when you're doing an event, like a seminar or whatnot, a three-day intensive or a workshop or whatever else, the audio team, that's rented. You're renting these people. And I've watched people just lease these businesses and then go, you know what? Let's, I, I want to lease you for a while and maybe we just acquire you because I'm using you so frequently. And so if I bought you, like, what would that look like? I go, well, why don't we date for a while? Why don't you lease me and then I'll give you an option to buy me if we decide that we, we like working with each other. That's a lease option. Renting your time and renting your business to come do my event. If we do that enough times, you have an option to buy my business from me at this determined price, at this determined uh, time. It's a lease option. I see it all the time, all the time, in all sorts of different businesses. It's bonkers. It's absolutely bonkers. And, and, and lease options obviously are pretty uh, common. I mean, you guys could go to Lease Trader right now. Here's, here's an interesting one. You can subject to somebody else's lease. Okay, a lot of people don't even know this. Let's pull up leasetrader.com. A lot of you guys don't know this. You guys want to go get a dope-ass car today? Go to leasetrader.com. Okay? And if you go to leasetrader.com, you can take over somebody else's lease subject to. You can take over somebody else's lease subject to, which means you don't even, a lot of times, you don't even have to qualify for these leases. There you go. Lease a car or get out of a lease. Okay? How about go away? How about let's get in a lease? Ooh, I can take over a twenty, a twenty twenty Lamborghini Huracan for twenty nine hundred and eighty eight dollars. I have lease terms. Okay, now there's a down payment on this one. They want twenty five grand. Ooh, look at this one. Twenty twenty one Porsche Taycan, Taycan, whatever you call it, a stupid car. And they're the incentive offered. They're going to give you forty eight hundred dollars. They're going to give you forty. Look at this seller. The seller is offering a cash incentive for you to take over their lease. Guys, this is creative finance at its finest. Ooh, this one's good. I might do that one. That one's dope. I was just talking to my wife about I'm giving I'm giving away my um uh, not my, not really me. The white the uh, the exterior white is not really me. But you can take over, okay, pending review. That means somebody else has it under contract. $2,000 a month, 32 months re remaining. You guys can take over somebody else's lease. And then what happens is at the end of the lease, you have the option to buy these. So this is where creative finance is really interesting. These people qualified for their leases. Okay? These people qualified for the lease. They put a big down payment down. They got a lease option. I can go buy their lease option subject to. I can take over that subject. I can lease their lease option. I can take over their lease option. And people act like this is new. It's not happening all the time. It's everywhere. Guys, this is everywhere. I bet you there's a lot of people that don't. 
They don't even know that these things exist. Now, now I feel like I should go to Lease Trader and get my get myself one, right? What do you guys think? What do you guys think I should be driving? Oh, by the way, guys, I'm so sorry. I have not been watching the side chat. Alphon, uh, Alphon, thank you for the 50 bucks. Means a lot. I'll probably get some throat spray to calm my throat down because I've been talking so much and so loud the last several weeks. Yes, Cassandra Johnson. Of course you can throw these on Turo. Absolutely you can throw these on Turo. So check this out. We've got Witchley says, first time coming across this website. Guys, is this helpful to hear these um, strategies in real life? Is that they're not any different in real estate. You guys confuse these, but they're everywhere. These are happening all the time in real life. Everywhere. Everywhere. Let's see here. What do you think? What do you guys see, see me as a, what do you guys see as my daily driver? What would, what would you guys see me driving? I, that's a hard thing for me. I'm not so much a car guy. I'm a work myself to death guy. Let's see. X6. Eh, it's cool. It's all right. I have a commitment problem to these things. It's like, oh yeah, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. The, the B7, that's dope. It's a little old man car. I really love the Escalades, like the black Escalades. Those are sick. Let's see. M5 competition. How is the M5? Look at this. Zero down payment. Zero down payment. M5 competition. I almost should just get this damn car. Just to show you guys how easy it is to buy somebody else's lease subject to. 28 months left on contract. Total allowed on lease. The BMW's lease is located in Phoenix, Arizona. Dude, seriously? Watch. No, I don't want to. I don't want to sign up with that. Give me Google. Sign up. Sign me up with Google. Um, verify via SMS. Okay, great. Let's do this. Watch how easy this is. People, people be sleeping on this. Perfect. Come on, dog. Let's go. Oh, I wonder if I can just give them my cell phone number. Oh, they don't want, they, they won't. Oh, I have to upgrade my account. Okay, great. No problem. Um, so lease trader is actually one of the more, more restrictive websites. There's dozens here. Watch, let's do this. Take over a lease. Okay. So obviously a oh, swap a lease. There's another one. Swap a lease, lease trader, quit a lease, assume a car lease, lease takeover, quit a lease.com. Um, credit karma. No, that's not going to be it leasequit.com. So there's all sorts of stuff. There's even YouTube videos about this. Okay. Guys, this is the same thing in real estate. That's it. Let's see. What did, what did people say? Um, they think I'm a drive. I, I drive. I have a F-150. I have a platinum F-150. Let's see. Nobody cares about what I drive. I love it. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely not a Lambo guy. I could I I think Lambos are for it's weird. I want to say what I think they're for, but that's me being judgmental. They're just not for me. Lambos are not for me. It's not they're not cool. I feel like they're overplayed, over like lame, so lame. And I'm also a practical guy. I'm just a practical guy. I really I want an F150. I want an F250 diesel extended um, bed. I, okay. For real, the CT five V, um, black wing, 100% I would drive that. Okay. I would 100% drive the black wing. I used to have a Tacoma. Love it. I currently have a Prius and I have a Prius, a Kia and an F one fifty. And my drive, my wife has a Tesla model X and a um, Escalade, the 2022 Escalade, like decked out version. So like for my wife, I'll buy whatever car, right? And the Escalade was my idea for the family. But like for me, 
Prius. I could care less. Like when I'm by myself, could care less. But I think it's time. Like I'm 40, basically. It's time for me to just get a really nice car and do all that stuff, right? Um, a Lexus coupe. No, not me. I'm definitely not a Lexus guy. For me, in my mind, Lexus is a cheap, a cheap vehicle. Um, did we give our, yes, I gave my Prius away. Um, okay, cool. So sorry about this. Let me, let's get back to this. Sorry guys. I, I, I derail. So we've talked about, okay. We've talked about sub two. We've talked about seller finance, couple of stories, lease options, arbitrage. Okay. It's interesting. Very, very interesting. What I would do is I'm going to challenge you guys, okay? I'm going to just talk about these stories, and what I'll do is I'll probably do another one next week. I'll do another multiple stories about novation agreements in everyday life, executory contracts in everyday life, short sales in everyday life, um, Morby method in everyday life. All these things actually happen in everyday life. You guys just don't see it, okay? So thanks again for all this the, the chat money, guys. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So here's a couple of things I, I have to announce. Um, a lot of people have seen me talk about the multifamily deal. We just closed on a 408 unit, $103 million acquisition. So congratulations to myself. Yes, myself for all the hard work. Thank you to my team. And most importantly, thank you to all the investors who invested with us. Super excited this last week, I was able to fly the investors out to the North Carolina project. It's in Charlotte. And personally, meet them at the property. I flew them all in first class, put them in a hotel, had dinner the night before, had a meetup with them the next day. We shot content at the property so they, they could all get you know, content shot with them there. So congratulations to all of our investors that are part of that 408 unit portfolio. It was really cool to see a lot of the parents who invested they brought their children. Their children are playing on a playground. And one of the mothers started crying about how she's like, it's cool to see that I own a portion of this 408 unit, massive, like 20 building complex. And I'm watching my children play on the playground. It, it just means the world to me. So um, amazing, amazing stuff. Also, um, on my Instagram stories, for anybody that's been following me, we are going to be releasing another multifamily opportunity to the little guy. Most multifamily opportunities for you to become an owner of start at like a $100,000 minimum of an investment. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be releasing it to the little guy. In fact, the name of our fund, the name of our company is called the Little Guy Opportunity Fund. So we're focusing on the little guy. We're giving everybody an opportunity to become a part owner of our next multifamily series of purchases. So you don't have to be an accredited investor. It means you don't have to be one of these rich people. You could be a regular Joe Schmo and your money would go into the project and you'd get a monthly check every single month. You'd be a partner with me and you'd be a part owner of a multifamily project. So that's going to be coming out pretty soon. Watch my Instagram stories for that. Another really important announcement is the invite only challenge is back this week. 30 days ago, we broke a world record. We had 1,254 people submit their first offer, their first time, all simultaneously in one moment, 1,200 and no, 1,234, I think. No, 1,254 offers were made in one day. That challenge was a two-week challenge, and we're getting rid of that two weeks, and we're condensing it into three days. So this week, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday, it's completely free. Anybody that came last week, Literally, we were on like day seven and this lady comes in on day seven and she was like, when are you going to sell us something? And I was like, I'm not here to sell you anything. I don't want you in my mentorship. I don't want you spending any money. I really want our group, our accountability leaders to love on you and give you guys the courage, the faith to go out and make your first offer, have people support you when you go out and make your first offer on your first deal. And I want you to fail. I genuinely want people to come into this three-day challenge this week just to fail. So we're doing it Thursday night, 5 p.m., Friday night, 5 p.m., and then Saturday at noon, okay? Uh, check this out. So Pace, I did 60 offers on Friday. Thank you so much. Um, all right, here we go. There we go. Pace, 
My wife has followed you and has signed up to your program. She's doing wholesale. I'm so excited and pumped to start this journey as well. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Shelly says, I would like to invest. I would love to invest as a regular Joe Schmo. I, maybe we should call it the Joe Schmo fund, something like that. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, would you would love to give away my car to buy two more? Yeah. Do you have attorney to write out? Okay, I don't, I don't know what we're talking about. Sorry. I think I missed some of your messages. I apologize. Okay, cool. So who is going to be part of the invite only um, challenge this coming week, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday. The focus for the invite only challenge is to focus on brand new people, people that have zero confidence People that have zero skills, people that have zero um, understanding of the strategies in real estate. We have a lot of experienced people that are in there for free to love on them, give them advice. And I'm in there myself. I run this challenge myself three hours on Thursday night, three hours on Friday night, and then three hours on Saturday, noon to three. Okay. So those of you, um, I will give you the link. This will be the only time this week that I actually share this link. The reason we're going to be calling it the invite only challenge is that you have to be invited to this challenge. Okay. So please save that link. It's the air meet link. I'm sharing this one time. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to join my free Facebook group. You're going to be in the free Facebook group and we're going to be doing this challenge together. So please make sure you guys get the link either here on the side chat or get that um, with your accountability leaders because starting uh, tomorrow, I'm only going to let people in through an invite, somebody who's already in the challenge. We have 2,500 people that were in last month's challenge that will all get the link coming up. And the only way you'll be able to get into this challenge is to get the link from those 2,500 people. Our goal is to break a world record every single month. Last month, we broke a world record, 1,234 offers in one day. This month, we're going to try and hit 2,000 offers in one day a world record. We are currently working on the technology that we can track these offers so we can show this to Guinness so that Guinness can actually put us in the Guinness Book World Records as breaking a world record of the most offers submitted in one day um, in real estate, all simultaneously. That's something that we're attempting to do. We want you to fail. We want you to fail with us. You will be on a team with other accountability, accountability leaders You'll be on a team with transaction coordinators, real estate agents. People will be on your team. Again, the people that were in this challenge last month came in, had somebody on the seventh day say, Laura. Okay, sorry. She, my wife is looking for our daughter. Um, so for those of you that are in um, trying to get in the challenge, please save the link. The way it, it um, happens is it costs me a dollar for everybody that shows up. Truly, last month's challenge cost me $2,500. I made no money. We didn't charge anything for it. People were blown away. I spent probably 40 hours um, last month, personal time running the challenge every single day. And man, did we have a lot of fun. The problem is I can't do that for two weeks every single month, but I can do it for three hours for three days. So nine hours consecutively, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The goal is for you to learn how to comp a property and to submit an offer and fail at submitting an offer. So you finally take action. There's so many people that are new to real estate that have never submitted an offer. There's people that have never comped a property. There's people that don't have the confidence to comp a property. They don't have accountability leaders. They don't have people they can rely on and they don't have Zooms that are happening that are more private settings so that they can get more intimate help. We are doing that for free. We are trying to break the mold so we're going to start talking about it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday um, in the free creative finance with Pace Morby Facebook group so that we can encourage you guys to show up on Thursday night, 5 p.m. Arizona time. So if you're East Coast, that's 8 p.m. Friday night, um, Arizona time is 5 p.m. East Coast is 8 p.m. And then on Saturday, we will be submitting our offers all collectively. We're not going to just tell you to do it. We're going to do it together. There's nothing to sell you. Um, we're just going to help you guys get started in your real estate journey. And I hope you guys all follow along with us. We had 800 people come into Sunday service. Okay. 
Um, we're con- we had 800 people come into Sunday service tonight, guys. I can't appreciate you anymore. So thank you so much. Um, so do me a favor. Come join me on Thursday night, 5 p.m. Arizona time. And help, if you're experienced, come in. Become one of the accountability, accountability leaders. And if you're brand new, I promise you this is the environment that you need to be in. Um, we had, again, I'll say this the last time, we had multiple, multiple people in the side chat during the challenge going, when is he going to sell his mentorship? Why isn't he selling something? He's going to sell something. And then I finally pulled one of the ladies who made the comment on the side chat and I go, you don't know me very well if you think that I've got something to sell you. I have nothing to sell you. I don't want you to join my mentorship. I want my mentorship students to help you. And I want you guys to do deals with each other. I want to see my students succeeding by taking what they've learned from me and going and helping the general public who really desperately need to learn how to comp, value properties, understand uh, paperwork, understand what to do, what's the process of wholesale. And so I'm going to give you guys through the invite only challenge, I'm going to give you the greatest wholesale education that's ever been given. People charge 10 grand, 15 grand, 20,000, 30 grand, 40 grand, $60,000 if you've gone to rich dad, poor dad. Um, people charge a lot of money to learn how to wholesale and real estate invest. I'm going to teach you guys every single month for nine hours for free collectively and we will advance our education. And as you are in the challenge with us for free, in a year from now, we want to have 10,000 people submit an offer at the same time in one freaking day. So please join me. Let's change the game. Let's freaking break the mold. I want wholesale educators to be like, hot damn, dude. I got to step up my game. Pace is giving away all this free knowledge. He's actually getting people to take action instead of just talk about it. And oh, damn, Pace is actually doing the action with them. Oh, Pace's wife is doing the action with them. Oh my gosh, Pace's team is doing the action with us. So I look forward to hanging out with you guys on Thursday, 5 p.m. Arizona time, Friday, 5 p.m. Arizona time, and then Saturday, 12 noon. So take the link. Um, if you are an accountability leader, we are going to be doing a Zoom sometime this week and walking through what the goals and objective of this upcoming week is. And I look forward to hanging out with you guys. So thank you. Next week, I'm going to do another Zoom. I'm sorry, I'm going to do another uh, Sunday service about the other topics, novation agreements and regular life, executory contracts, short sales, Morby method and cash transactions and how to convert those into creative and essentially tying them into everyday stories in our everyday lives. I hope this episode of Sunday service was helpful for you to hear some regular stories that are going on with arbitrage, sub to seller finance, novation agreements, et cetera. I wish I heard these stories when I was brand new in real estate. I would have been like, damn, this is happening a lot. How do I get my hands on these things? Okay. Laura Smith says, what time is Sunday service? Sunday service has not changed in two and a half years. It's every Sunday, 7 p.m. Arizona time. Okay. So guys, thank you so much. We appreciate you, all 800 of you that came and hung out with us tonight. I appreciate you tremendously. And we will see you guys on um, Wholesale Hotline tomorrow, 5 p.m. And then I will see you guys Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday at